Hey everyone, so it's great to be back here in Toronto. I haven't been at FITC Toronto for a few years, so it's really fun to be back here. It's always really inspiring. I want to thank Sean and everyone for putting on such an awesome event. So as you can see from this slide, my name's Neil Mendoza. Um, I've always been fascinated and interested by technology ever since I was a young kid. I used to take apart things around the house, like our telephone, and put them back together again. They normally worked okay afterwards, and my parents were never that impressed with this kind of stuff, but I went on playing with technology. Eventually, I went to university, and I liked numbers and geeking out, so I decided to study computer science. And at the time, I wasn't really aware that you could do fun things with computers. In my head, I was aiming for a career in a gray cubicle somewhere, writing accounting software or something. And then at some stage in my life, I came across the creative coding community, and I saw people doing fun, creative stuff with computers, and this blew my mind that I could both be a geek and someone creative at the same time. So for a few years, I just started playing around, doing stuff like this for myself, for fun, on the side of my work, and eventually people started employing me to make more creative things with technology. And about three years ago, after doing this for a while, I thought that I was making stuff which some people were starting to call art, but I had no idea what art really was. So I decided to go back to school and get taught what art was. So I did a master's at UCLA, so I hung out on the beach for a while, did some art, and I really recommend if you're thinking about going back to school to do it, because at the time I didn't really think I could afford it, didn't think it necessarily made sense, but it was some of the best two years of my life, just being able to make whatever I want, and um, that being my whole full-time job. So what was I thinking about when I was making art, and what... what does most of my work revolve around? Well, because I'm making art technology, a lot of it is focused on technology. And one part of technology, I think it has a very homogenizing effect on our brains. So the way we interact in, with the digital world most of the time is using a 2D abstraction of it, but we've evolved to interact and perceive the world in three dimensions. We like to imagine that when we're sitting looking at a field of wildflowers on a computer monitor, it's as if we're lying in a field of wildflowers, but I think that it has a really bad effect on our neurological processes trying to process all data mediated through the same devices. You're using the same devices to interact with your friends, to make creative work, to do your accounts. And it's not just that we get information in through the same devices. We also put information back into the digital world through a very limited set of devices, through keyboards and mice and touch screens. In fact, it's worse than this. We've started mediating our whole existence through these devices. Even when we might not need to be looking into the digital space, we start getting our devices out and mediating our experience through these devices. So in my work, I like to try and make people think about alternative ways you might use technology, trying to possibly denormalize technology by using it in more interesting ways. Um, so the first project that I'm going to show you is based around one of these bits of technology. It's based around a multi-touch screen. So before the iPhone and tablets came about, this was a really new and interesting technology. It was pretty mind-blowing. Until then, the way you interacted with technology was via an abstraction. You would move your mouse on one plane, and you would see something move on the screen on another plane, and suddenly you could actually touch something, and it would move directly. And so it's, the first time this was really made public was by a guy called Jeff Han at the TED conference, and he basically gave a hacker recipe for creating this kind of device, and it blew a lot of people's minds. You could basically build a sci-fi interface in your garage. So I started playing around with this technology, and this was my first tablet computer. It worked with a webcam inside it, and it would track the shadows on it. And it seemed like a fun toy, so I started building stuff with this technology, experimenting, and I came up with an idea for an installation. And the installation would be you would paint on a large screen, you would be shown a famous iconic piece of artwork, and you would copy the piece of artwork and then after you had copied it, you would see the average of your interpretation with everyone else that had used the installation's interpretation. And this is what the end piece looked like. So this is the reason I'm showing this project. It was one of the first publicly shown bits of art that I'd ever made. 
And I really had no connection to this world. I just went out there and started making stuff. And if you want to get into this scene, the barriers to entry now are so low and the, the cost of tools, you've really just got to start making stuff. And if you don't know how to do something, it's really easy nowadays to just pick up tools and look on YouTube and explore how to do this stuff. So if you want to learn to code, for instance, come up with an idea that you want to make and work out how to do it rather than learning to code for the sake of learning to code. So anyway, we built this installation. And here's one of the iconic pieces on the right and one of the average drawings on the left. Again, iconic piece on the left, average drawing on the right. I think I flipped that round before, so apologies for that. People also got creative and painted whatever they wanted, which is really nice that people did get engaged creatively. And I think that was a thing that worked really well about this installation, that we were tapping into something that people already had a relation to. People like drawing stuff. And it may be even if they weren't professional designers or artists, you were kind of reconnecting with like experiences they had in school. But something else I learned interesting about from this installation was that as soon as we put a paintbrush beside the installation, people started interacting with it very differently. It stopped being a screen and started to be a canvas. People's affordance kicked in, and they suddenly became artists. And I think this is really interesting, because as soon as they start using their hands in a different way, the way their brain works changes as well. And I think this is, kind of relates back to what I was saying before about us inputting everything into the digital world through screens. As soon as you start using hands to manipulate, and touch, and feel, you're going through a completely different physiological process. So for the next piece, I started to try and explore this. I wanted to make a projection mapping piece, but I wanted to make a piece that you can manipulate. So I did what every good projection mapper does, and I came up with a low-res mesh that I was going to project onto. And once I designed this low-res mesh using some software, I had to bring it into the real world. So I used a machine called a CNC machine. So a CNC machine is kind of the opposite of a 3D printer. A 3D printer works by adding material, whereas a CNC machine will take material away. So I gave my low-res low mesh to this machine and made some tool paths, and it hacked out my low-res mesh into a 3D form. I then made some software that would project onto this 3D mesh. So this software is written in open frameworks, which is a creative coding toolkit. If you're familiar with processing, it's similar to that. It's a, it's a coding framework to make it easy to make creative things. So it'll let you draw pretty stuff on a screen or take input from sensors. So I wrote this software in open frameworks, which would project onto the mesh, but it would also take data in from the physical world of people manipulating this sculpture and then change the projection accordingly. So this is what this piece looked like once I'd finished it. So essentially, these glowing balls inside this installation were running a physics simulation, so they weren't real glowing balls. And every time they hit one of these glowing crystally things, they would trigger a noise. So it was kind of part musical installation, part projection mapping. So you kind of get the idea. Let me go back and show you. So you get, sorry, show navigator. Anyway, my keynote is misbehaving. So anyway, one, part, one thing I learned from that was you need to tell a story. People would interact with this, and they would play with it, but it was very much a toy. There was nothing that people could connect to on, with this installation because it was very abstract. It was very much computer graphics, and it was kind of, it, you know, it, it, they still related to it as they relate to other digital abstract rendered scenes. And I wanted to create something which was more physical, something which involved objects that people might have more of a relationship to. And this came when a friend of mine started talking to me about making a thing for Adult Swim, which involved hair. So this seemed like a great opportunity to make a piece that involved two things that people love big hair and robots. So we started talking about, OK, so if you could have a robot wig and bring a wig to life, what would it do that would be useful? And we decided it would be fun to make a robot wig that would apply makeup to you. So this is what we ended up with. So the actress here was actually an 80s soap star in the Netherlands, apparently. And not being Dutch, I wasn't aware of her. But she was a super good sport. 
This is Pino. He was the star of the show, really. So she was a really good sport, but when we went in there and showed her this device we had created, like the, the prototype device was kind of built on this like hard hat. So you had this hard hat covered in hair and servos, and I think she got a bit scared, but on the day she really kind of lived up to it and played along with how crazy device. So this installation was part puppetry and part robotics because we discovered at the end of the day that to make stuff feel really creaturey and um, it was much easier to puppet some of the parts than to let servos do it. So it was a combination of both. And this guy, who I said was the star of the show, he was puppeted so that we could make him feel more realistic. And that meant I had to sit behind the actress and puppet him. And at one stage in the shoot, the light blew up, and so the people in the studio ran back and found out some, a light from the 1960s and put it right beside me. And I'm like, okay, great. And then at the end of the shoot, my eye started to hurt, and two hours later, I looked like this. <laughs> so, yeah, apparently this light that they had found was only really meant for taking still photos. You weren't meant to sit next to it for 12 hours at a time. <laughs> um, so this was one of my first pieces where I like, made a complicated, useless machine. And I, I found it worked really well to denormalize the technology. People became really interested in how the piece worked. But it also works on the flip side. By using technology to bring stuff to life and make it move, it changes people's relationship to those objects and decontextualizes them. So you get this really nice interaction between the technology and the objects. So after making this piece and having fun with Pina, I decided I wanted to make another piece which involved a small creature that people could anthropomorphize. But with the previous piece, it was only in a video. I decided I wanted to make a piece that people could actually experience in real life. So I decided I wanted to make something with fish. And humans at the moment, we've decided we really like destroying fish's habitats, which is a real shame. And so I decided it would be a great idea to empower a fish, allow a fish to destroy our habitats. So I decided I wanted to make a piece which allowed fish to smash small bits of human furniture. So I started thinking about this, and for some reason I came semi-obsessed with the idea of having this fish be able to control a hammer which went on a semi-circular track. I think originally it was maybe an aesthetic thing. I thought it would be cool to have a semi-circular aquarium with a semi-circular track, and then I realized maybe it's just because I like making my life harder than it needs to be. Anyway. At the time I was making this, I was an artist in residence at Autodesk, and they have some really amazing tools. So I started experimenting with different ways I could use their tools to create some kind of semicircular track. And they have a tool called a water jet cutter, which is a really fun device. It's basically like getting a fire hose and then mixing the water with sand and making it come out of a tiny hole, like a fraction of a millimeter thick, and it lets you cut metal or stone or whatever you'd like. So I started playing around with this and cutting semicircular gear trains and was pleasantly surprised to find that if I did that, I could mesh one with a gear I'd bought off the internet. So I carried on developing this and I made some kind of overly complicated fish hammer actuation device. And the prototype version seemed to work pretty well. And so the next task was to work out how to track a fish. So this is Smashy, my smashing fish, and I think the pet store owner thought I was a bit crazy going in there, like trying to find the optimal fish for computer vision. He was a bit confused. Um, so eventually I found the optimal fish and the optimal gravel to be able to track a fish. So again, this uses open frameworks, and it's tracking the color of the fish and then pulling that blob out and working out where it is in the tank. And uh, the next task was to link fish to hammer. This is actually harder than it sounds, because if you're using the kind of industrial motor I was using, normally you know where the motor's going to go, but apparently Smashy didn't want to play ball, and we had no idea where he was going to go. 
So I used, a, for the geeks out here, I, I used a algorithm called P, a PID controller, which allows you to have various parameters you can tune to make unpredictable movements sync up to, so make outputs sync up to unpredictable inputs. So this is what I came up with in the end with Smashy. No fishes were, ha were harmed in the production of this video. Smash is happily living in my house in LA at the moment. So one thing which really seemed to intrigue people about this was whether the fish had any idea what he was doing. And people would stand around for half an hour and stare at Smash and be like, does he know? What's he, like, is he enjoying this? Is this fun? So, yeah, you are the first people to see this because Smashy the Smashing Fish is not on the internet yet, so. So one thing I learned from this after spending a very long time trying to make this circular track was that people don't really care about circular tracks and over-engineering. They just care about fish and hammers. So um, it's very easy to get stuck in technical vortices when you're, like, making technical work like this, but it's very important to keep in mind the whole time the bigger picture and make sure that you realize that the technology is not that important at the end of the day. It's the story that's important. So after making this fish-based piece, I was kind of enjoying making devices for small creatures, and I decided I wanted to make something that was constructive rather than destructive. And I feel like small animals have really been left out of the whole selfie craze. So I decided I wanted to make a self-portrait device, but for hamsters rather than hipsters. Uh, so one thing that I find really interesting is that we take for granted how we can store huge amounts of information in tiny spaces. We can fit the Encyclopedia Britannica on a micro SD card if we wanted to. Here on the screen you can see a project by Michael Mandiberg, and he basically printed the whole of Wikipedia, and it took up a lot of gallery space. This is just like one of four rooms. And he didn't actually print out the whole of Wikipedia, because that would have been bad for the environment. He printed out some wallpaper, and he printed out a few copies to be representative. So for this piece, I wanted to explore this phenomenon of data storage. But I wanted to encode my hamster, hamster selfie in some kind of non-traditional data storage, which kind of brought it back to the fore, could actually make people see where the hamster art was being stored. And I wanted to do this in a mechanical way, so I did it using a thing called a cam. Um, a cam is a device which, um, as the cam moves, it makes a different piece of material go up and down. So I would started to work out if I could try and encode a hamster drawing inside a cam. And I did this by writing a piece of software which traced out a hamster drawing and then as it traced around the hamster drawing, it would leave a trail of a cam. So basically, it traces the hamster drawing and simulates a machine and keeps track of where parts of that machine are. Then if you reverse this process by letting the bit of the machine that you've traced out press against the orange thing there, you get a hamster drawing. That was the theory anyway. So I made some of these cams that the hamster drawing machine software had given me and printed them out using, or CNC'd them out using the trusty CNC machine and hoped that it would all work. But after putting them together, it turned out that it just drew a squiggle, and that's because I had entered in a number in my CAD program in by half an inch wrong. So back the drawing board again, re-engineering, and 
Here's what I ended up with, my hamster-powered hamster drawing machine. So for this piece, I decided to have a telepresent hamster because the fish was OK in the gallery for two days. And I think the fish didn't really know what was going on at all. He was just fishing around. But I think keeping a hamster in a gallery for more than a couple of hours, I think the hamster would have been confused. But fish are fairly unaware of their surroundings. So after making these two animal-based pieces, I started to look at people looking at them, and it started to feel a bit more like a people. It, it was a spectating interaction. I wanted to get people back involved in the equation, so I started to think about ways which I could do that and make a more interactive piece. So here on the screen, you can see a piece by the artist Ken Feingold. And he got two chatbots to talk to each other and animated the, what they were saying using these two animatronic heads. And I find this phenomenon of us talking to machines really interesting. We spend a lot of time now talking to customer service robots or Siri or whatever, Alexa or Google Now. And we kind of forget that we're talking to a machine and all of our words are going up into the cloud and being logged and analyzed. And I think often if you're talking to a customer service robot on the phone, it can be quite a frustrating experience. So I decided to make a piece which would turn this into a physical manifestation of that. So I started thinking of ways that I could physically show the annoyance of talking to a customer service robot and what acts you could do to people's words. And I decided to make a machine that would kick people's words. So I got lots of my friends to come in and let me take molds of their feet and started playing around with molds of their feet to make kicking machines. I discovered if you make a solid plastic block the shape of someone's foot, it's pretty heavy and not that useful as a robot foot. So I went to eBay and found out you could get these manicure training feet. So I ordered a manicure training foot off the internet and started playing around with that, and that seemed to make a perfectly good robot foot. So the idea of this, of this installation would be that you would speak into it, and then your words would get kicked. So I'm like, how would it be fun to speak into an installation? And, I have a, I decided like the kind of horns you get on the end of a trumpet or a trombone would be pretty funny, but I had no idea where to get them. So it's kind of fun when you're doing this kind of project. Often you spend as much time trying to find the bits you need to build it as you do building it. And I found this guy who lived an hour away from where I lived who had a lot of horns. So I went to inspect his horns, and he had no idea what I was talking about when I was trying to explain my project. But he sold me some horns, so that was great. And I took them back to my studio and started playing around with them, painting them white, and eventually managed to assemble them into a installation. And this is what the final installation looked like. Hello? Are you listening to me? So again, this was written in open frameworks. And listening. find the nearest coffee shop. The physics of the words is driven by a physics engine called Box2D. Mary has a little lamb. And every time the projection of one of the words gets near the foot, then the, an Arduino will trigger the foot to kick. The foot is actuated Mary. by a linear actuator. What's your favorite color? Is. You know, that doesn't even make sense. Sense. Make. So this is, I suppose, my first foray into mixed reality, um, combining the physical with the digital. And I think it's a really interesting area. And I really liked how this worked, because it would get people to come and interact with each other as well as just the installation. But this brings me on to the subject of virtual reality. So in case you missed this, this was when virtual reality started to really hit the big time. And Time did an article on Oculus founder Palmer Lucky, but I guess Time magazine didn't get the memo that VR is actually meant to be cool. So the internet spent a lot of time speculating what was going on here, whether Palmer Lucky was at a rave or sitting on the toilet. 
and they eventually worked out that he was actually on a horse riding holiday with Vladimir Putin. But I think VR has a lot of great potential, but it suffers from a lot of, a lot of the problems I've been talking about already, in that all of our interactions with VR are going to be mediated by software, and the big corporations' interests aren't really aligned with people's interests. They want you to spend as much time inside VR as possible, possibly looking at their adverts or buying their games. So I think it's a really great medium, but all of us in here have to make it useful and useful for people rather than just useful for corporations. And there are people doing really great stuff with it. For instance, here's a piece by Marshmallow Laser, Piece, Marshmallow Laser Feast, where it got people out of the digital world and actually going into the forest and interacting with nature and with each other. So there are definitely fun ways of using VR, but it's still a lot, a lot is out for, you know, up for grabs, so we should definitely do our best to make it something that's useful for people. But outside of virtual reality, we're already spending a lot of time in the virtual world. We mediate huge amounts of our experiences through our phones, like I've already mentioned. And I decided I wanted to make a piece which took some of these phones and made them into something which maybe didn't suck all of our attentions away from each other and make an experience that people could enjoy together. And the thing about phones is they become obsolete every two or three years, so everyone has a lot of drunk phones sitting around in their drawers. And I decided it would be fun to make a piece which used these junk phones. And I started to think about what makes a phone a phone, and the noise is pretty intrusive. So I started thinking about, okay, what things in life have kind of loud noises, but people find them really beautiful, and I came upon birds. So I decided to make some birds from junk phones. So I came up with these robot mobile phone birds. And you could phone the robot mobile phone birds, and they would all sit in a tree. There were like three or four of them that would sit in a tree, and you would phone them, and they would start flapping around and then start phoning each other. Again, people really like things that they can anthropomorphize and play with. Here's a little video of this in action. So that was one of the first videos I ever made of my art, and I'm, I'm not that proud of it now, but I showed it because I think documentation is really important. So if I could go back and do that piece again, I would spend at least an hour or two filming it in a decent way. So if you're making this kind of work which only lives in one place at one time, physical work, it's very important to make sure you get decent footage of it. One really fun thing about this project was because it was just a palette of junk we had to play with, it led to a lot more exploration. There's a danger when you're building projects with technology, you get into a very engineering mindset and plan everything out ahead of you, so it's very important to experiment as much as you can. This was a great opportunity for that. And I showed this piece again in an exhibition and had a slightly different setup. And in this setup, we had like an old phone. They would talk to the birds. And I left it set up there. And after about three days, the gallery phoned me and said, oh, the mobile phone, I mean, the rotary phone that you put in the installation is broken, so I went back and fixed it. And then every three days, I would get a call, and young kids would just break this thing because they had no idea what it was. They had not really encountered a rotary phone in their lives. I think this is a great illustration of us taking interface devices for granted, which, some, which we've just learned. So it's really like easy to assume that a mouse and a keyboard or whatever bit of technology you're using just makes perfect sense because you know how to use it. But it, this is a great illustration of how that's not true at all. But I like working with junk because when we're media artists, it's very tempting to just use the newest and latest pieces of technology. But 
why, why should we? We can do anything with media art, so why don't we bring stuff back to life? And I got the opportunity to work on another project like this when Brother asked me and a couple of friends to build an orchestra for them out of printers. So this was actually a project which has a very rich heritage. A lot of people have done this before, and normally I like, don't like rehashing old ideas, but this, this seemed to have a lot of potential. So we went to a rubbish dump and started looking at different bits of junk we could use possibly to make into an orchestra. And we, like, this is a very interesting area. Like, apparently there are people who go to these dumps and buy pallets of this stuff and send it to Africa. So they were a bit confused when we turned up and said, oh, can we start listening to your scanner and see what it sounds like? But we got a lot of junk and took it back to our studio and started playing around and came up with uh, using these two different things to make music. And the thing on the left is a stepper motor. And it works by stepping a fraction of a degree every time you step it. And the thing on the right is a car door lock actuator. So with a step motor, if you step it at the same frequency as a musical note, it will play music. So we put together a little test of this, and this is what this looked like. So, yeah, our neighbors in our studio were pretty unimpressed by this project, having like every five minutes for a month, but um, they forgave us, so that was great. Um, one thing I learned doing this project was if you're going to make a project which has lots of things which are exactly the same, it's a really great idea to mass produce them if you can. So we made a, a little printed circuit board which would drive all the printers. It had various bits and bobs which were useful for making music, for instance, stepper motor drivers and... Um, things to drive the car door lock actuators, and it was MIDI powered. So we then got a friend of ours to start composing for it, and this composition process was pretty interesting because he had no idea what the instruments were going to sound like. So we would um, we would start putting things together, and then we would sample them, and then send them over to him, and he would start composing stuff, and then send it back to us. We didn't really know what it was going to sound like until the day that it happened. So. The day came when we were going to set up. We chucked everything in a van and set it all up. And we, we only had a day to set up here, which was pretty ludicrous. So we drank a lot of coffee during that one day of setup time. And we decided it would be really great to use recycled power supplies as well. And this seemed like a really great idea. Yay, the environment. But it seemed like a really great idea until we got on site and they all started blowing up and there were puffs of blue smoke everywhere. Um, but we fixed that by going to our local version of Radio Shack. But this is what I look like after one day of setup. And here's what the final piece actually looked like. So I'm not going to show you this whole video because I think a lot of you have seen it before, but one really frustrating thing about this project was we made this video and it looked really crazy and it looked so crazy that a lot of people didn't really believe it had happened. So we said to the advertising agency we would really like to set this up somewhere and let people see it for real so they can really believe, really see for themselves that it's actually happening. We really created these things. And unfortunately, it just didn't happen because they just didn't have the budget for it. So this is all online on my website, so you can feel free to check that out. But feel free to um, yeah, go to my website, neilmendoza.com, if any of these projects I rushed through you would like to go check out again. But yeah, as I say, it's very important to explore ideas to their full potential. But I started to think about other things I could use to make music with, and one of those things that occurred to me was 
My Little Ponies. So I like rainbows, I like My Little Ponies. So I started playing around with My Little Ponies and Action Men and seeing if I could make music using a combination of those two. And I came up with another machine, which is called the Ponytron. <laughs> So even though this piece was a, a lot simpler than the knife orchestra, I think people almost appreciated it more because A, the weirdness of having a My Little Pony with an action man head, but B, nostalgia. People immediately have a sense of like positive nostalgia with these different objects. So you, you get the idea here. And then that inspired me to play more with action men, and um, I also thought action men had been left out of the selfie craze, so I created a selfie-selfie machine for action man. This was for an online exhibition where every day a website would call up action man and ask him to press a button, and action man would press a button and take a selfie of himself, so you would get this never-ending recursive selfie generation thing. So that was pretty fun. And then I still was kind of obsessed with this music thing, so. I started looking around, thinking about other things I could make music with. And then I ended up in the 99 cent store, where there's a lot of crap which really shouldn't be worth 99 cents. And I came to the knife row, and I'm like, oh, knives, that sounds like fun. They mean a lot of things to different people. Some people use them for hunting, some people use them for cooking. So I took some knives and other sharp objects back to my studio and started experimenting. I very quickly found out that if you're going to start automating meat cleavers, then you need to be a little bit careful. I had lots of nicks on my hand. Eventually, I realized that it was a good idea to tape a napkin to the bottom of any sharp object. Um, so I experimented with various different objects, and this is uh, what I came up with with the knives. <laughs> So again, this was pretty interesting seeing... So this was playing Staying Alive, because it seemed like an obvious choice for some knives to play a song related to being alive. So it was pretty interesting watching people interacting with this when it was moving and when it was switched off. When it was switched off, everyone seemed to think it looked incredibly dangerous. But as soon as they started playing music, they, they transformed into completely different objects, which was a bit scary because then people lost their sense of danger and started sticking their fingers near them, so that wasn't good either, and I eventually had to put up a rope to protect people from sharp and high-voltage objects. At the moment, someone is trying to get me to bring this to an exhibition by taking it on the plane with me, but I'm not sure if that's going to work out very well. Um, so... You can build this yourself if you want to. Um, it's possibly one of the only pieces, the only um, instructables on their site where you could both cut yourself and electrocute yourself at the same time. <laughs> um, I think it's really important to share how to make your project, so whether that's instructions on how to build things or code for how to code things, because everything I'm building, I'm building on the shoulders of giants, on like, people have built tools that I use, and I want to build tools that other people can use. And if we want to have some hope of creating a future where technology is important, technology does what we want it to do rather than what companies tell us it should do, then we need to build the tools to make it do that. So you can also download the code for making the uh, Electric Knife Orchestra on GitHub. So for my final project, it's also going to be a musical project. And I decided I wanted to make a rock band. But not this type of rock band, this type of rock band. So I wanted to make various instruments that would throw rocks or drop rocks or vibrate things against rocks to make music. And I first started experimenting. I'm gonna, uh, there was, like I say, a ver various instruments, but the ones which took me longest to devise were the ones which were going to drop rocks. Originally, I thought this would be quite a straightforward problem, but it turns out that because rocks are all different shapes, it's kind of hard to pick them up one at a time. So this was my first attempt at designing a rock-dropping device. 
And that didn't work very well. After a lot of experimentation, I came up with using magnetic rock. So this device would, you would insert a rock in the bottom, and a magnet would take a magnetic rock up to the top and drop it out. So this seemed like a great way of transporting rocks up, albeit they could only be magnetic rocks like hematite, which have a high iron content. So this is version one. This is version two, which got a bit larger. And then again, I was doing this at Autodesk, and they very kindly pay for your, all your materials and let you use all these crazy tools. So here's some machine porn for you. This is me cutting out the final version of it out of an inch and a half thick block of aluminium. And yeah, it's, it's crazy that you can just in, input a vector and you get a big heavy block of aluminium out. So that was one instrument. Another instrument was a xylophone, a mechanical xylophone. So I wrote some software that would let you output vector files by inputting material properties. So you input various properties about aluminium and you get a vector file that you can cut on the water jet cutter out. And here's my first uh, attempt at making a holder for these aluminium keys I was cutting. So there are a couple of instruments that were going to be part of the rock band. And here's what the final rock band looked like. I spent a long time thinking about what tune the rock band should play. And for some reason, I ended up with Here Comes the Sun, because that seemed like a kind of daily experience of a rock sitting on the ground somewhere. They sit there, and it's cold, and they wait for the sun, and the sun comes. So it made some kind of sense in my head. As you can see, the big, complicated rock throwing devices actually made a pretty, like, unimpressive ka-chunk sound, but they look cool, so maybe that's the most important thing when you're making stuff like this, who knows. But um, again, instructions for making these, the mechanical xylophone I put on the instructor boards because I think it's really important to build a body of knowledge that we can build unique things with. And this is the last thought that I want to leave you with. I guess the role of an artist is to kind of pull back the veil on the normal, do things that maybe make people question technology, question the arbitrariness of the different bits of technology we use. And I think building unique experiences is a great way to do this, trying to step outside of the normal software tools and interfaces that we use. And thank you very much for listening to me.